Hello. Today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the models of the atom. How people thought the atom looked. How that view was modified through experimentation. And the main models we're going to be looking at today is Democritus's model, which you can see began a long time ago, which was modified by John Dalton, which was modified by J.J. Thompson, which was modified by Ernie Rutherford, which is modified by Niels Bohr, and then to our final model that we have right now, which in which Schrodinger was one of the main people who came up with this particular model. As we go through this, I want you to be aware of how the models were never discarded, only modified. So the theory was just improved upon and changed slightly each time, rather than being thrown out and start a new model. So what we're going to be looking at is the atomic concepts is our first unit we're going to go through and we're going to be looking at the theory of the atom. Now the people we're going to be discussing were certainly not the only scientists who contributed to our current model of the atom, but this is boiled down to take a look at some of the big changes that occurred over time. And this actually began in ancient Greece over 2000 years ago when the first idea of the atom came about. And one of the people, one of the philosophers who believed in this idea of an atom was a man named Democritus. And Democritus believed that matter couldn't be continuously divided. In other words, he and his other philosophers were sitting around, they're thinking, they're looking at stuff. Well, I can cut it in half, and I can cut that half in half, and I can cut that half in half. Is there a limit to how many times I can cut something in half? Is there a fundamental piece of matter? Now, a lot of Greek philosophers said, no, there isn't. Aristotle being one of the most uh, visibly known who disagreed with this idea. Democritus and his fellow philosophers believed that there was a limit. There was a point at which you could no longer divide an atom. He believed that matter consisted of small, indivisible particles, particles that can't be divided. As a matter of fact, the word atom comes from the Greek word atomos, which means indestructible. Once you get down to an atom, that's it. There's nothing smaller than that. They also believed that these particles were moving around. And the idea that matter consists of little particles moving around helped them explain what they observed. Now, they believed that you could take any type of matter and break it down into four different types. All matter, all energy, could be broken down into four different types of atoms. Three of these atoms want to form a rock band, and the fourth one, I guess, was kind of left out. The four elements are earth, wind, fire, earth, wind, and fire, and then there's water. And they believe that a mixture of any of these elements could create anything. For example, blood, blood was hot, so they knew it contained fire atoms. Blood was also a liquid, so they knew it contained water atoms. Blood also moved, so they knew it contained wind atoms. And just by mixing different amounts of these atoms, they could come, come up with all the materials that they could observe. Now, this was all, this was all not actually science. It's more of a philosophical idea that you look at it and say, this makes sense. They didn't experiment to show this. There was no experimental theory at this point. And yet this idea still contains a lot of ideas that we believe in today. So the idea of do atoms exist, that idea, that question persisted for a long time. Some people still said yes, some people still said no. And it was right around the beginning of the 1800s when a guy named John Dalton put together all the evidence that he himself had discovered, plus all the evidence from other experimenters, other scientists of the time, put all these things together concerning matter and came up with a theory that explained all of the experiments and all of the theories and all of the observations. And his theory at the time said, there's few different parts. Number one, atoms do exist. All matter is composed of small particles. There was no observations that said that matter could be continuously divided anymore. So Dalton's first part says, 
Yes. Matter is composed of small particles. You can't break them down. There's atoms. The second thing he proposed is that the reason why there were elements, elements were substances that couldn't be broken down anymore, like gold. They knew about gold, but gold couldn't be broken into parts. Well, the reason why was that gold is made up of atoms that are identical in size, mass, and properties. All gold atoms look exactly alike. But there were different elements as well. So we have silver as an atom and gold as an atom. And the reason why they're two different elements is because there's two different types of atoms. So all gold atoms look like gold atoms. All silver atoms look like silver atoms. But silver atoms don't look like gold atoms. His third point was that atoms combine together and they make compounds. And they combine in a simple ratio, a couple of these and a couple of those types of atoms together, which made compounds. This actually is what we currently believe, which is why we write formulas. Hydrogen sulfide, which is stink bomb gas, is made up of two hydrogen atoms for every sulfur atom. Something more complicated, like uh, lead four oxide, which is found in car batteries, is one lead and two oxygens. And of course, there's H2O, there's CO2. So all these formulas basically come from the idea that to make a compound, you put atoms together in a specific ratio, two to one, one to two. His fourth point was that a chemical reaction is not the creation of atoms or the destruction of atoms. It's just the rearrangement of atoms, putting atoms together, separating atoms, moving them around in different ratios, that's how chemical reactions work. This actually explains the law of conservation of mass. No matter is created or destroyed, the atoms just rearrange themselves. These four points are important to know. You don't have to memorize them word for word, but you, de you do need to know the four ideas from Dalton's theory. But as a result of this theory, we come to our next model, which is known as the cannonball model. At this point, we believe the atom is just a small, solid object. No parts, nothing else, just a solid ball that can't be broken up. The cannonball model. Now, sometimes later, this idea that an atom is made up of one solid piece that can't be broken apart was questioned. And part of it was due to experiments like those of J.J. Thompson. And what Thompson did was he experimented with cathode rays. Scientists at the time knew that if you took a piece of metal and you exposed it to enough electricity, you could get these rays that went shooting off of the piece of metal. He found out that these rays that were being given off by a piece of metal were actually negatively charged pieces of mass. So the idea is an atom is somehow spitting out negatively charged pieces of matter. Well, how is this possible if an atom is the solid ball with no parts? Obviously, the theory had to be modified. And he tested different types of metals, and he always got the same types of negative particles. No matter what element he used, he always got these particles. So to explain this, Thompson believed that matter must be made up of pieces. It's not a solid ball. And one of the pieces has to be negatively charged. Those are the particles he was seeing. So further experiments show the discovery of a positive charge in the atom. And so Thompson assumes that what an atom is is a mixture of positive and negatively charged particles all mixed up. And this was referred to as the plum pudding model. Now, what's plum pudding? Well, if you've ever had the unfortunate situation where you've had to eat plum pudding, uh, not my favorite food. It's uh, basically um, pudding with nuts and fruit and whatnot all mixed up. The closest thing that you might know of is uh, if you have like jello with fruit in it. It's just the whole thing. So the jello itself would be the atom, and the pieces of fruit would be like the negatively charged particles hiding within the atom. Well, this theory lasted for a while, and the atom is now made up of parts. But the question was, how are the parts organized? Well, Ernest Rutherford, 
he worked with radioactive particles and he figured he could use his radioactive particles to, to show that Thompson's model of this ball of matter with these little negative parts stuck in it was true. So Rutherford wanted to use what he knew to show what an atom looked like on the inside. And he did one of the most well-known experiments in science. It's called the gold foil experiment. And what he did was he fired positively charged alpha rays. This is what he worked with. He knew that these alpha rays had a positive charge and he shot them at a very thin piece of gold foil. Why gold? Because gold is a very dense element, which means the atoms were probably really big. Gold is also highly malleable, so we could hammer the gold super thin, so maybe it was only a couple of atoms thick. Very, very thin. And then what he did was he fired these positively charged particles at this very thin piece of gold foil, and then he put the screen behind the gold foil that would catch the alpha particles, and he could show which way they turned. So what he's got here is here's where the radioactive source was. He put a radioactive source here, and he designed it so they only fly out in this direction here. So the, the, so the alpha particles, positively charged particles, are coming out this way. There's the piece of gold foil. Then as they pass through the metal, they would hit this screen back here, and they would actually give off like a little flash of light. He could detect where his particles went. In 1910, Rutherford and his co-workers were studying the angles at which alpha particles were scattered as they passed through a thin gold foil. Most of the alpha particles passed through undeflected. However, a few were found to be scattered at large angles, some even back in the direction from which they had come. This meant that they had collided with an object much more massive than the alpha particles themselves, yet so small that only a few alpha particles encountered them. This atomic level view shows what is happening. Most of the atom is occupied by the low mass electron. The nucleus is small and massive. When an alpha particle encounters a nucleus, it is scattered at a large angle. So what we saw in that quick video was what the results were. You saw the little bright flashes on the screen. Now, what Rutherford expected to have happen is for most of the particles to kind of go straight through and maybe wiggle a little tiny bit because of the negatively charged particles or affecting the direction of the positively charged rays, but that's not what happened. Most of the rays did go straight through. And absolutely no deflection. It was like nothing was there. And some of the particles, as you saw in the video, deflected, and some deflected so much that they actually seem to come straight back. That was very surprising because Thompson's model didn't predict this would happen. So we knew that Thompson's model had to be modified. And the way Rutherford and his team explained this was that, number one, atoms are mostly empty space. They're not solid pieces of matter. An atom is mostly this big empty thing. But within that big empty thing, there's something stuck there. It's mostly empty, which is why most of the rays go straight through. They don't pass through anything. But there must be a dense center, a very tiny dense center within the center of the atoms. And it has to be positively charged, which is why the positively charged alpha particles deflected from them. You can see the rays were actually bending away. And what happened is if a particle, alpha particle, came straight towards this densely positively charged thing, almost straight on, it reflected almost straight back. So Rutherford's conclusion was atoms are mostly empty space and atoms have a dense positive center. So now our atom looks different. It's not a solid piece of matter. It's not a, a jello with a bunch of little things floating around in it. It is a big empty space with a very tiny dense positive center. And the electrons that we found out from Thompson's experiments are just scattered around in the empty space around this. This particular model was referred to as the Rutherford model. So our atom has gone from a solid ball of matter to this ball with different parts stuck in it. 
to this empty space with a dense positive center with negatives floating around the outside. Along comes Niels Bohr. Okay, this is a little bit more, more modern. This is the 1940s. And what Bohr did was he said, yeah, atoms exist. And yes, there's a dense positive center. Yes, electrons are around the outside. But how are those electrons arranged? Are they just generally thrown out there? Or, or is there some special arrangement of that? And it turns out there's a very special arrangement. Bohr helped to show that electrons exist in different, definite areas around the nucleus. They can't just be anywhere. They have to be in specific places. So if here's the nucleus, electrons can hang out in this area here, or this area here, or this area here around the nucleus, which we refer to as energy levels. So we have an energy level here, and here, here. Some atoms have even more energy levels. Some have less. But the electrons can exist here, not in between energy levels. They're either here or they're here. Now, what he also showed was that the further you are from the nucleus, the more energy your electron has to have. So if you're an electron that's this close right here, it's low energy. But if your electron is here or here, it has more energy. Well, there's an electron with low energy. There's an electron with more energy. Okay. The electrons also didn't have to stay in their little areas. They could jump. An electron here could gain energy from a source, from heat, from light, from other sources, and it could actually jump up to go to a higher energy level. So that electron had to absorb energy. Now it has more energy. Now it can exist way out here. Well, if electrons can gain energy and jump up, then electrons can also give off energy and jump back down. So this electron here is going to release its energy as it jumps back down. The interesting part is the released energy is always the same type. We'll talk about that later on. Bohr named the levels originally. He called this level K, this level L, this level M. We've kind of gotten rid of that now. We actually just call these levels 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But you have to remember that energy level 1 is closest to the nucleus, lower energy, 2 has higher energy, 3 has higher energy, and so on and so forth. So now our atom is even more organized. Dense positive center, mostly empty space, but the electrons hang out in specific areas, and those specific areas each have their own energy associated with them. Electrons can jump from area to area by gaining or losing electrons. Furthermore, when you test different atoms, they have very similar types of energy levels. Not exactly the same, but all atoms have energy levels that are very, very similar to each other in shape and structure. And this is what we currently, most people currently think of when they think of an atom. They think of a dense positive center with electrons going in little orbits around the outside. It's like the Jimmy Neutron model. This is what you typically see when people think of an atom. There's your nucleus right there, and there's the electrons going in these neat little circles around the outside. And you see it all over the place. There's all sorts of different diagrams, and everybody thinks that's what an atom looks like. Unfortunately, our current model doesn't make an atom look like this. While that model was referred to as a planetary model, it's not our current model. Over the course of the next 50 years, and still currently today, a new model has developed, which is known as the wave mechanical model, which, of course, was created by Dr. Wave Mechanical. No, actually, it was created by guys like Schrodinger and Einstein and Heisenberg and a bunch of other scientists. And this modified Bohr's model, yes, atoms exist. Yes, atoms have positive and negative parts. The positive parts in the center, the electrons around the outside. Electrons jump from level to level. But the levels don't look like what we think they look like. Electrons are not in circular orbits, but they exist in specific spaces around the nucleus. Not only that, but you don't know where an electron is going to go next. It's going to hang out in certain areas, but where it goes next, it's a little unpredictable. Actually, it's completely unpredictable. 
So what I'm doing here is I'm drawing a dot every time I locate a single electron. All these dots are made of a single electron at different moments. And you can start to see how the electron, it's just jumping randomly around, but as time goes on, you're going to start seeing a pattern of where the electron tends to hang out more and where it doesn't hang out. So again, the electron is going to stay within a particular area or two, but we don't know where it's going to go next. If we allow this to keep going, you should start to see an area where the electrons really do hang out and areas where the electrons really don't hang out. That's kind of what we're starting to see here. This area right here is where the electron spends a lot of time. But it also seems to spend a lot of time out here. And if we speed this up just a tiny bit, we get something like this. There's an area where the electron spends lots of time. There's an area where the electron really doesn't spend any time. There's an area where it spends a lot of time. And these areas, these make up our energy levels. The other point that the wave mechanical model made up through all of these scientists' discoveries and mathematical equations is that this energy level has different parts to it. A level has sublevels. The sublevels have another degree of complexity known as orbitals. But we'll get into that later on. So let's review one more time. Democritus and his crew said that atoms are tiny, hard, they are uncuttable, they are indivisible. That was the idea that they believed was true. Dalton actually looked at various experiments in his own work and said, yes, atoms exist. Now, Dalton has the four different parts of his theory, which you should be aware of. And then later on, Thompson said, yeah, there's atoms, but they're not solid balls of matter. They have positive and negative parts in them. There's the plum pudding, like raisins in a plum pudding. Yeah, raisins and pudding, yum. But that wasn't fi the final model. Rutherford's experiment came along and said, not quite like this. It's a dense positive center. This is all empty space out here. There's nothing out here, but the electrons are chilling out here on the outside. Niels Bohr comes along some time later and says, well, the electrons are in specific areas around the nucleus, and the electrons can jump from place to place. And our current model says that electrons hang out in specific areas, but they don't follow some nice circular pattern. They just hang out in an area, and that area is the ultimate area. is called an orbital but it doesn't actually circle around. It bounces all around and stays within a particular area. So an orbital is currently defined as the most probable location for an electron, not some circular path around the atom. So those are our current models. Again, these aren't all the models of the atom. These are the most important models that we know of. And you should be aware of how each model takes something from the last plus new experiments to modify it.